comes from Ephesians chapters 5 and 6. Let's begin with prayer. For Christian homes, O Lord, we pray that you might dwell with us each day. Make ours a place where you are Lord, where all is governed by your word. Amen. Have you ever paid attention to those fake family pictures that come inside of a new picture frame? If you have, then you've probably noticed that they always look just a little bit too perfect, right? Here's an example. I mean, the parents are always ridiculously attractive. They always have perfect hair and perfect skin and perfect teeth. They're always dressed in the latest fashion trends. I mean, take a look at Dad's combo of the loose tie and the rolled up sleeves. I mean, he's looking good. And the, and the kids, they're always beautiful, and they're always smiling, and their clothes never have food stains or grass stains on them, and they're always sitting very patiently as the photographer continues taking picture after picture after picture. It's, you might say it's a, a picture-perfect family, right? But let's be honest. Is that what real families look like? I mean, what family in their right mind with four kids would own a white couch and white rugs? I would give it about five minutes before Junior spills red Kool-Aid all over it and ruins both of them. Be ridiculous, right? And let's face it, this, this isn't what real families look like. They're too good to be true. They're per too perfect to be true. And if we're being honest, uh, I'd say this is maybe a more accurate depiction of <laughs> our families most of the time. But as unrealistically picture-perfect as this first white couch family is, I think there's a lot of pressure on families today to have that same kind of a picture-perfect persona, right? You got to have uh, beautiful homes and beautiful cars and, and impressive jobs. You've got to have a bulging bank account and a Facebook page full of pictures from another amazing, perfect family vacation. You got to have your kids involved and excelling in every single possible activity and in every academic endeavor so that everyone can stand and marvel at your picture perfect family. But should we feel that kind of pressure? Or for our families, is there a more perfect picture for us to pursue? This morning, as we kick off a new worship series called God's Wisdom for Your Family, that's what we're going to seek to better understand. Not the wisdom of the world or the expectations of the world, but what is God's wisdom? And what are his expectations for our families? And what is his picture-perfect plan for us to have picture-perfect families. Believe me, it's a much more beautiful picture, even more beautiful than the white couch family. And God lays out his picture-perfect blueprint for families in the book of Ephesians. And it is shockingly devoid of any conversation about extracurricular activities and family vacation time. God's inspired writer, the Apostle Paul, he takes the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians just to, to pile up praise to God and to recap for these people again and again God's amazing grace. And then in the last three chapters, chapters 4 through 6, Paul takes the time to describe how Christians are going to then live in response to God's amazing grace, including his instructions for us before us here today for families. And Paul begins by giving some uh, instructions from God by addressing the wives first. He says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Two words into the first set of instructions, and people immediately start pumping the brakes, right? Submit. That word submit brings to mind images of, of powerless, helpless women 
who are entirely dependent on their husband for everything, who stand always ready at his beck and call to immediately answer whatever demand he makes of them, at best like an employee, at worst like a slave. You see, when people hear that word, those two words, wives submit, many people go into sort of a rage, frustration, willing even sometimes to throw away all of the rest of Scripture over these two words, wives submit. And they go into a rage because they hear these two words and they assume that means that God thinks that women are inferior or incapable or unimportant. But let me tell you right now, that's not at all what God is saying here. And I want to share with you today three passages from elsewhere in Scripture that make it very clear that this concept of submission has nothing to do with a person's value or importance or worth. First, I want to point you to Paul's letter to the Galatians, where Paul writes, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, to God, there's no hierarchy of value depending on your race or your social standing or your gender. Because through Christ, when God looks at people, he sees them of equal value, of equal importance, because they're all one in Christ. Second, we hear in the Gospel of Luke that the boy Jesus was obedient to his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. Now, the Greek word that's translated obedient to in this passage is the same Greek word that's translated submit in our sermon text. So would we say that that Jesus submitted to his earthly parents, even though he is the perfect God-man and they were sinful human beings? Did he submit to them because he was in some way less valuable or less important than them? Of course not. And third... Paul writes again in his first letter to the Corinthians, the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, talking about God the Father, so that God may be all in all. Again, made subject to comes from the same Greek word as submit. So would we say that that God the Son, he submits to God the Father because obviously he's less valuable, he's less important than God the Father. Again, of course not, because the scriptures teach very clearly that all three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are co-equal in power and in glory. And so these passages can make it very clear for us that this concept of submission has nothing to do with a person's value or their importance. A person does not submit because they are inferior. Rather, a person submits... Literally, they they give up some of the rights that they have so that God's will can be done, so that God's will can be carried out. And we break down that word submission in Latin. It literally means to be under the mission, to put yourself under the will of another person. So when a wife submits to her husband, she's putting herself under the mission, the will of God. And what exactly is the mission and will of God? Everything that God says, everything that God does, is so that ultimately he can bless his people. And so God is telling us here that when a wife submits to her husband, he is promising her that he is going to bless her through that. As Paul writes, when a wife submits to her husband, she submits as to the Lord. Now that's not saying that a a wife's husband is her savior, Rather, it means that by submitting to her husband as God asks of her, that's another way for that woman to serve her God. It's another way for that wife to show her faith and her trust in God. Because as she submits, as she sacrifices to carry out God's will, she trusts fully and completely that God is going to care for her and provide for her and bless her through that. Some people, they look at a, a woman who submits to her husband and they say, well, that's a, that's a weak woman. That's a woman who can't take care of herself, so she's forced to submit to her husband. But that's the exact opposite of the truth. 
No, a, a woman who willingly, joyfully even submits to her husband because that's what God asks her to do. That is a very strong woman. A woman who is incredibly strong in Christian character, who is incredibly strong in her faith in God and her love for God because she trusts completely that God in this too is going to care for her in everything that he does. And yet, it's a pretty challenging concept still. Especially challenging if we only focus on what God says to wives and don't pay any attention to what God says to husbands. And that's why it's important for us to be reminded of what Paul reminds us here and what God said to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when he first united them together as one in marriage. He told them, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. See, God didn't design marriage to be two individual people working independently of each other. No, God brings the couple together and makes them one in marriage. And so they're not two individuals working separately. Rather, they are one unit working together, not for the good of each individual spouse, but for the good of the two who have become one flesh. And so God has designed marriage to be like a, a three-legged race. Maybe you've done one of these at like a family picnic or something like that. If those two people run separately from each other, they can't run that race successfully. Because they are bound together, because they are united together, those two people have to run together in the same timing, with the same thoughts in mind. Otherwise, if they run separately and independently of each other, what's going to happen? They're bound to do nothing but flail and fall. And so God has designed marriage to work in the same way. Not two people working independently of each other, but two people who have become one working together as one. And so because God unites two people together as one in marriage, it makes sense that his instructions to wives and his instructions to husbands would go hand in hand. As Paul continues, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. God has appointed the husband to be the head of his household, to care for and, and lead his wife. But God doesn't give him that authority and that power so that he can misuse it and use it like a, a demanding, greedy king. No, the husband is given this authority, and then he's told that he needs to love his wife in the same way that Christ loved the church. And how does Christ love the church? He loved the church so much that he willingly sacrificed everything, his power and his glory and his very own life so that he could save the church. And husbands, that's the model that we are to follow in the way that we lead and love our wives. Not using that authority that we've been given like a, like a greedy, demanding king, not in self-service, but rather as a humble servant who is self-sacrificing. That's what God expects. That a husband will love his wife so much that he will willingly give up everything, including his own life if necessary, so that he can put his wife's needs ahead of everything else. And that's a challenging call from God too, isn't it? And so you can see the wisdom of God. The wisdom and the beauty of the way that God has designed marriage to be carried out. Not two separate people working for themselves, but two people who have become one working for the one. And, and let's be honest. Wives, how much more willingly can you submit to your husband when you know that everything he does, every decision that he makes, is thinking about you and communicating with you and loving you and putting your needs ahead of everything else so that he can care for you above everything else. And husbands, how much more willingly can you love your wife in a completely self-sacrificing way when you know that she respects you and honors you and loves you and trusts that you are going to lead her and your family in the best way possible? 
See, when husband and wife, they carry out the roles that God has given to them in Scripture, then that marriage truly can be picture perfect. And when you look at marriages that that don't make it, can we trace it back and see that one or both of the spouses failed to carry out that role as God told them? And after touching on marriage, then Paul continues talking about the relationship between children and parents and how that can be a picture-perfect relationship. He says to children, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Pretty simple, right? Children, obey your parents. Love and honor and respect your parents who care for you. It's a simple command, but it's so profound, so impactful, that God chose to record it as one of the Ten Commandments that is to govern all people for all time. But again, here we can see how God has woven all of these roles together in a family unit so that they all play off of each other. Because then when Paul addresses parents, and and fathers especially, this is what he says. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. He tells children that they need to honor and obey and respect their parents. But he also tells parents, in the same way, you need to love and honor and respect your children and lead them in the most loving way possible. Now, we're going to touch on parenting quite a bit in the future weeks of this sermon series, so I'm not going to touch on it a whole lot today. But there's one big highlight that I want you to take away from this. Those of you who are fathers and and might potentially, God willing, be fathers in the future. What is the one most important role that God gives to you who are fathers? It's not make sure your kid can throw a tight spiral. It's not make sure your kids get into the best college possible. It's not make sure your kids and their friends think that you're the cool dad. The one role that God has given to fathers is to feed and nourish your children with the word of God. He gives that to fathers, not to the father's pastor, not to the father's wife, because he has put it aside and the wife has to pick it up. No, he gives that instruction to fathers. So dads, let's man up. Let's take this role that God has given to us and let's take it seriously. And let's be the ones who are feeding and nourishing our children with God's word because that is the single most important thing that you can do for your children. There it is. God's perfect blueprint plan for a picture-perfect family. And he tells us that if the husbands and wives and parents and children can carry out these roles in the way that he has laid them down for us, then our families can truly be picture perfect. But I'm sure this is the question that it's on everyone's minds and hearts. Is this what your family looks like? Or does your family more closely resemble the white couch family than it resembles the family that God just described for us here? Let's face it, our family's day-to-day actions are far from picture-perfect, right? Wives, do you always joyfully, willingly submit to your husband's decisions and actions, trusting him completely to do the best thing for you and your family? Husbands, do you always put your desires last and put your wife's needs first so that you can focus on her above everything else? Children, do you always joyfully respect and honor your parents and obey them in everything they ask of you? Parents, do you always focus first and foremost on the spiritual needs of your children over everything else? If we're honest, and we hang an honest portrait of our family life next to the the white couch and white rug and white smile picture that God just painted for us, we have to admit that our family picture is marred. It's stained with the the mud stains and the red Kool-Aid and the temper tantrums and the bad hair days of our sin and our failures to carry out these roles that God has given to us. 
And we fail to carry them out because they all require us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And our natural inclination is not to submit to one another, but to demand that everybody should be submitting to us. God included. See, if we're on our own, our families are far from picture perfect. But thanks be to God that we're not on our own. And that's why it's possible for us to look at you and your families and say that, that your family is picture perfect. How? Notice the common theme, the common recurring thread that's running through all of these instructions that God has given to the members of the family. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Fathers, bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The recurring theme that is running through every single one of these instructions is the Lord, Christ. Jesus Christ, who we're told, gave himself up for the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. On our own, our families are far from picture perfect. But through faith in Jesus, when God looks at the picture of your family, he no longer sees a family that is filthy with the stains and the wrinkles and the blemishes of sin and failure. Through faith in Jesus, when God looks at your family, he sees a family that is picture perfect. Because Christ lived in perfect submission in our place, and because Christ lived in perfect self-sacrificing love in our place, because Christ went and took away our sins by his death on the cross. Now when God looks at you, he sees a family with white couches and white rugs and white robes of righteousness that have been washed clean in the blood of our Savior Jesus. And that beautiful truth is what motivates us to carry out these roles that God has given to us to love our families. Maybe you noticed, kind of out of character, right in the middle of all these instructions that Paul is giving, cons consistently saying, you, 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 suddenly right in the middle he breaks into this note of joy, this highlight of grace. Including himself, he says, for we are members of Christ's body. You belong to Jesus. You are part of his body. And that is the driving force behind everything that God asks of us here, that we belong to Christ. And so husbands and wives, you can motiv be motivated to love each other as one flesh because God has made you part of his one flesh. And parents and children, you can be motivated to love and honor and respect each other in the way God asks of you because God is your father and you are his children. You see, when Jesus looks at us, he sees a family that is picture perfect. And that motivates us to live in the same kind of love in our families because in love, Jesus has brought us into his picture perfect family. And maybe that seems a little bit too perfect to be true. But it's the truth. Because God in his wisdom has promised that exact thing to your family. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.